So a very different kind of episode today, and I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm sort of a movie nut. Um, might be even what you would call a film buff, if that term is still in use. I don't really know who it is. My tastes and interests in cinema are all over the place, but I, I gravitate towards pre-code movies. That stuff is made between 1930 and 1934, and I'm going to explain exactly what that means in a moment. If I had to pick one movie, though, that encapsulates how I feel about life in 2021, it's probably Gold Diggers of 1933. So why don't we um, have a drink and a talk about that over in the lounge. <laughs> So first things first, this is going to be a bit of a different kind of an episode if you can't already tell. I've done drinks from movies previously, but the focus in those older episodes is always on the drink. There aren't really episodes about the movie. <laughs> this is going to be the reverse of that. Don't worry, there's still going to be drinks here, but it's sort of a new kind of an episode that I'm testing out. And if it happens that you guys like this sort of thing, I got plans to keep it going on an occasional basis. Maybe, um, maybe one of these a month if I can manage it. Now as I've said, I love pre-code movies, uh, but maybe I need to explain what pre-code means. Nowadays, you got the MPAA, that's Motion Picture of Association of America, rating system, which categorizes movies based on content. You know what that is. That's uh, G-rated, PG, PG-13, um, later in edition, uh, R, NC-17. That system was created in 1968, and it's evolved a bit since then. Some ratings change names, um, PG-13 was added, but basically it's all the same idea. Now there's a lot of talk actually about that system being kind of a de facto censorship system since R-rated and PG-13 movies command a smaller audience by their very nature. And they can't make as much money as PG or G movies and thus they don't get made. But when it was introduced in 1968, the rating system was a huge liberation in filmmaking and it unleashed a wave of some of the greatest movies of all time in a movement sometimes called the Movie Brats actually. Okay, but what about before that, before 1968? Well, you couldn't do nothing because prior to 1968, all movies in America were made under the auspices of the Motion Picture Production Code, otherwise known as the Hayes Code, or simply the Code. The Code was introduced in 1934, and it was a series of pretty restrictive rules that outlined quite simply what you could or couldn't do in a movie. During the 34 years that the Code was fully enforced, there were a handful of exceptions. Directors like Otto Preminger and Billy Wilder, they were able to push boundaries and skirt the rules, um, and then in Sidney Lumet's The Pawn Broker in 1964 it spelled the death of the code. But for the most part, um, there's really narrow guidelines on what could or couldn't happen in a movie, okay? The tom cats and the pussy cats are all right, but the kittens are illegitimate. And they certainly are. Unless they're married by a preachy cat. No preachy cat, no kittens. No, you can't use it in 39 cities. The code itself, by the way, is written in a kind of code. It doesn't exactly always spell out what it means. Like when it says, correct standards of life subject only to the requirements of drama and entertainment shall be presented, or law, human or natural, shall not be ridiculed, nor shall sympathy be created for its violation. Everyone knew what these guys meant when they said you need to uphold natural laws and correct standards of living. There's a lot of details too, and I'm not gonna go into every single clause, but I will put a link down there for you to read it yourself if you want. I mentioned that the code was also called the Hayes Code. That's because it was administrated by William H. Hayes, a politician and organizer for the Republican National Committee and a member of the Harding administration, until it was actually that he turned out to be a big criminal. It right smack dab in the center of the Teapot Dome scandal. He somehow recovered from that Teapot Dome scandal and slithered E.A. Westward from the Harding admin to become the chairman of the Motion Picture Producers and Distributors of America, where he got to work, because of course he did, quickly trying to make sure only the right kinds of movies got made. At that time, that wasn't exactly 100% without merit, because the states, and sometimes even individual cities in America, had their own censorship boards, and the studios were jumping through hoops trying to satisfy them state by state to get their movies shown. Sometimes different states would get different edits of the same movie. You must put brassiers on those dolls. Oh, you know Connecticut. Mm. What do they have to do in Massachusetts? Wear red flannel drawers? So right now you might be asking yourself, what about the First Amendment? How could we even have censorship boards in America? Well, in 1915, the Supreme Court decided Mutual Film Corp versus Industrial Commission of Ohio and determined that the exhibition of moving pictures is a business, pure and simple, originated and conducted for profit and not to be regarded nor intended to be regarded by the Ohio Constitution, we think, as part of the press of the country or as organs of public opinion. So movies, First Amendment doesn't apply. 
not at least until 1952, when the court reversed that decision, which was one of the factors in dismantling the code. Anyway, Hayes is trying to clean up the movies. Ostensibly, he's trying to get the studios to self-censor so the government doesn't get involved. In 1930, a group of concerned Catholics, specifically Martin J. Quigley, Joseph Breen, Father Daniel A. Lord, Father Fitzgeorge Deneen, and Father Wilford Parsons, they get together and they draft up the rules that they think the movies ought to abide because they're very concerned about this. The main author was Father Daniel A. Lord. He actually had to get permission from his cardinal to do this. And they hand their code over to Hayes. And Hayes falls in love with what he sees on the page. He says, this is exactly what I need. So that's in 1930. Hayes calls all the studio heads in and hands them out the code and tells them, boys, this is what we gotta do. We've gotta protect our phony baloney job, gentlemen. And they kind of agree. Harumph, harumph, harumph. But they also ignore the living hell out of it. I didn't get a harumph out of that guy. Because they liked the idea of using the code and Hayes code office as a shield against state censorship boards, but they had zero intention of actually doing the things it said. As long as they could say, hey, 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 I'm abiding by the code, they could convince state censorship boards to kind of be like, all right, well, if the Hayes Code is being enforced, all right, fine, we don't need to censor this. You know, that was the idea. Until 1934, when Catholic churches across America organized their adherents to threaten a boycott of all movies. And then the studios agreed to cede control of the film's content to the Hayes Code office, and thus the era of censorship begins in earnest. To put that in perspective, I mean, Hayes is trying to avoid the government getting involved in the censorship business because it's bad if the government is doing it, and it, I mean, it is, but what he's ended up doing is consolidating an enormous amount of power into his own office to control the content of everything that goes into movies in America, where, by the way, the movies get made. At this point, you know, you still have, um, it's pre-World War II, so you have a lot of European cinema, German cinema is obviously, well, 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 let's leave Germany alone, actually. <laughs> uh, Hayes and his group were really instrumental at making sure that American cinema did very little to criticize anything that was going on in Germany throughout the 30s. I'll leave that lingering out there. Basically, this dude is in charge of American culture. That's what's happened. You get to, if you can decide the content of all movies in America for a 34 year period, you get to pick what an entire generation of people grow up believing. Why don't you finish the job? I thought maybe you might have some conscientious objections to it. And I believe if our number would go a little better in blackface. Any time. You ratted on us, Terry! And I'm glad what I've done to you! They have to be destroyed. All of them! Uh, man talk. And that has ripples that goes on for more generations. I don't think that the full damage and weight of what the code and censorship in general in Hollywood film and the blacklists that followed has really been measured, you know? Because if you look at American society prior to 1934. All life, no matter how we idealize it, is nothing more nor less than exploitation. And through the 30s, through the depression. Only wild poets and anarchists eat that. It is a politically remarkably different landscape that is on a completely different trajectory. I don't think that's a coincidence. Hayes puts Joseph A. Breen in charge of actually administering the code, and he puts out a list of 117 people whose personal lives made them unfit to appear in movies. These are largely people who are gay, uh, or a little too Jewish, or a little left-leaning. Uh, there's a lot less written about the Hayes blacklist uh, rather than the later HUAC blacklists and so on, uh, but a great documentary, The Celluloid Closet, covers it at least to some degree. So that covers the rules that governed how we made movies from 1934 to 1968, and then from 1968 until today. But what about prior to that? What about between 1934 and 1930? Well, that is the era that we call pre-code, and that is where you get some really amazing movies made. Um, prior to 1930, one, you're, you're dealing then with early talkies, which are not known for being great. I guess that's no secret. Uh, they were still figuring out how to deal with speaking. And silent films came before that, which are often amazing. Uh, but by 1930, most of the kinks in the works of making sound pictures had been figured out. And now, of course, they had this code that they were supposedly following, which means that they could get away with nearly anything. And they did. If you're not already familiar with pre-code movies, it can be kind of a revelation. 
when you really see what pre-code means. From just a historical or anthropological viewpoint, I think seeing the kinds of things that people were talking about and concerned about making movies about in the 30s can be really enlightening. Of course, there's still huge issues of representation and othering and racism and all of the rest in those movies, but I would say that it, it's a lot less of an issue in those 30s movies maybe than even stuff from the 80s. I'm not really qualified to speak to that, but I personally think there's a lot more self-awareness of that in the movies from the 30s than there is in movies from the 80s even. I think there's a lot more agency for female characters in movies from the 30s, particularly pre-code movies once you get past the 34. I think one of the things my wife pointed out to me, one of the things that disappears immediately is like, oh, the women stop being characters. Okay. And you know, I'm a dumb guy. It just kind of went over my head. I was like, oh yeah, you're right. But um, they just sort of become objects, right? But I mean, prior to that, whoa, it's a very different scenario. So now that you know what a pre-code movie is, um, I want to talk about the one that I want to discuss today, which is Gold Diggers of 1933. But first, I'm thirsty. And Ginger Rogers in this movie, and there are two drinks named after Ginger Rogers, one that was actually published the same year this movie came out, 1933. So I want to make that one while we discuss the movie over in the bar, and then I'll make the other one from 1995, and we'll compare them. Uh, so let's go to the bar, right after this. <sighs> Look, I, I, I love the absolute simplicity of a bowl of cereal in the morning. I'm tired. I got a day out of me. I'm hungry. The poor, poor eat. Yeah, that's an extremely tempting kickoff for the day. And it doesn't hurt. I was basically raised on the stuff. That stuff, uh, you know, stuff that was candy masquerading as a healthy part of a complete breakfast. Clever bit of legalese there. And it's all undeniably delicious. But, you know, you can't actually eat like that anymore because it's garbage. Until I found Magic Spoon. Now, this is a commercial, and they sponsored this episode, and thank you to Magic Spoon for doing so, but here's the thing. I am honestly really picky about the stuff I accept as sponsors on how to drink. I get approached by a lot of snake oil sellers, and people with crummy products and business models that I just don't really want to support. And so I was very skeptical of Magic Spoon, and maybe I still am, to be honest, because I had them send me some to check out before I agreed uh, to do an episode with them, and I was blown away. This stuff tastes exactly like the cereal I grew up with and shouldn't have been eating. But it is completely not garbage. Zero sugar, 13 or 14 grams of protein, and only four grams of carbs per serving, and only 140 calories per serving. I tried the cocoa first, and to my mouth, it tasted exactly like a cereal uh, from my youth, whose name I can't mention for legal reasons. I loved it. Mm. Rudy is on the money too. A lot of people seem to love blending the peanut butter and the cocoa. The peanut butter is great, but honestly, I'm not huge on peanut butter stuff in general, so as it happens, that isn't for me. But if you pick up a variety box, which comes with cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter, you can try it for yourself and see. Again, I can't get over the taste of these things. They're incredible. Full disclosure that the texture is actually slightly different than you might be used to. It is still crunchy though. It's an excellent texture. It just might be different than you're used to. People ask me a lot for keto friendly cocktail suggestions, like all the time. And I'm always at a loss on that one. But for cereal, Magic Spoon is keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, low carb, and non GMO. That's a concern of yours. I don't know why I had to do that with my hand. I didn't. Magic Spoon is cereal reinvented. And they are extremely sure you're going to love it. So sure, in fact, that they back it with a 100% happiness guarantee. And if you don't like it for any reason at all, I'll give you back your money. So click the link below and use the code that's on screen at checkout to get five bucks off of your order. What flavor are you going to try first? Mm. This is my lunch today. Gold Diggers of 1933, it opens with this great scene of Ginger Rogers singing, We're in the money. They're rehearsing a musical number for a big stage show. Um, that same year, 1933, this book, Hollywood's favorite cocktail book, claimed to contain the favorite drinks of the biggest stars, for whenever that becomes legal again, later that year, uh, and features a Ginger Rogers cocktail, which is one part French vermouth, one part dry gin, one part apricot brandy, and four dashes of lemon juice. Shake and strain. Four dashes of lemon juice is a little bit of a weird one there. I mean, I could put lemon juice into a dasher, but I think it'll probably clog it. Um, I really think that four dashes here is probably equivalent to something like a quarter to a half an ounce. Uh, and the parts are probably three quarter ounce pours. 
I'm working off of what I know about cocktails from that time period. The other thing about that too is it says apricot brandy and then there's always a question of, well, do they mean uh, brandy made from apricots or do they mean brandy flavored with apricots? Hollywood, 1933, I'm thinking that they mean literally this, LaRue <laughs> apricot flavored brandy. And I, I think that that's what you actually want for this drink. So let's make it. And uh, thinking about that time period and everything, and the setting and the place, I feel like this gold Parisian shaker is probably the right one to use. There's been a lot of gold lately in my uh, drink making. So I'm using Dolan Blanc. I think when they say French vermouth, I think that the Blanc is what's being referenced. I mean, that's it just says French vermouth, so I guess it's open to interpretation. But I think a dry vermouth in this cocktail from the other ingredients um, might be a mistake. I think it's probably the Blanc. Let's put it this way. Typically, when I opt for the Blanc over the dry, if there's a question, I'm happy with the choice. That's just generally how it goes. I like the Blanc Vermouth. I think it has a lot more um, character. So, three quarters of an ounce Zolan Blanc Vermouth, three quarters of an ounce LaRue Apricot Brandy. That's the good stuff. My grandmother was always a fan of the Blackberry and three quarters of an ounce of a dry gin. Um, I'm using Aviation today. I happen to like Aviation Gin. I happen to like Ryan Reynolds. I would love to work with Ryan Reynolds. Ryan, if you want to do anything with your gin in my channel, I'd be more than happy to accommodate you. You can come to the lovely garage I produce it from in beautiful New Jersey. It'd be great. I'm gonna slice my lemon in half. And I said that I suspect that four dashes is a half an ounce in this case, and I I think that's right. I think a dash is probably an eighth of an ounce by that count. Just guess it, just guess it. Well, let's put some ice in there. Boom. Our ice is in the shaker and now goes in our drink. I find that these shakers are a little bit more prone to blowing out than other ones, so I'm a little bit careful with this one. I would say take it real slow at first and then go crazy. Let's strain away into my drink glass. This is my first attempt at making this drink, 100%. I haven't touched it yet. Um, you're noticing that the wash line is a little off. That's okay. <laughs> All right, let's give it a try. This is the uh, Ginger Rogers drink. It's Ginger Rogers' favorite cocktail, supposedly, from 1933. Ooh, ginger. I can see liking this. It's not my drink. It's surprisingly neutral. It's balanced. Nothing really jumps out at you. It's just not very interesting. It's kind of flat. Maybe a more juniper forward gin would be better. Maybe a little more lemon would be better. Um, the apricot brandy really is kind of front and center on this. Um, certainly a drier vermouth wouldn't do it any favors. It's nice. It's a light drink has a very, it has, you know, almost pear-like. It has a pear-like kind of quality to it. It tastes like apricots, but if I say like, it's a little bit like biting into a pear, at least that makes sense in my brain. I don't know if that'll make sense to you. A little bit, you, you taste apricots. It is not overly sweet at all. Um, I would say it's on the drier side of a drink. Is it great? No, it's not terrible. It's just not great. Well, Ginger, we have different tastes in a number of things, and this is one of them. Somehow I think I'll get over it. I don't know about you. So I mentioned that this movie opens on Ginger Rogers doing We're In The Money, but the show that she's doing it in gets busted up by the sheriff's department because the producer is late with the bills and the whole thing is getting repossessed. What again? Also, famous piece here where Ginger does the song in Pig Latin. She showed that off in rehearsals, or perhaps Busby Berkeley overheard her speaking in Pig Latin in rehearsals, and into the movie it went. Uh, Gold Diggers is a movie about and of the Depression. It's central to its setting and plot. The Depression, Derek. 
it follows three young down and out Corines who are just trying to get by and survive. You guys cut the bread and set the table. Have we any bread? Yeah, have we any table? Ginger is actually something of a foil to our heroines, a, a light antagonist. You look like Eunice. You do look like Eunice. Ouch! I love this movie. It has got just great funny dialogue and big musical numbers directed by Biz Busby Berkeley and Joan Blondell's in it. Uh, Guy Kibbe, Aline McMahon, Ruby Keeler, Ned Sparks, Warren William, uh, and Dick Powell. Directing duties were split between Mervyn Leroy and Busby Berkeley, as was in the case, I think, um, all of the Berkeley musicals from this time period, certainly the early ones. Mervyn is one of the names you're going to see directing a lot of pre-code movies, including one of my favorites that I think I'll give this treatment to down the road if this kind of episode turns out to be liked. It's called I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang. Freaking love that movie. The attitude of this whole movie is kind of about just spitting in the eye of misfortune and despair and playing hardball against your bad luck and the depression. They had their turn. Let's have ours. We'll take them for a ride. Sort of how I feel right now as we grind past the one year anniversary of the declaration of a pandemic and heading into lockdown. Bitterly optimistic? Recklessly optimistic? I don't know. Remember in this movie that when they're singing We're In The Money, they're flat broke. A few scenes later, when the girls learn that Barney has a new show he's putting together, they pool their resources to put one of them into a borrowed dress to go and convince him to give them all jobs. I mentioned this movie being pre-code. And while it's maybe not the most extremely pre-code movie I can think of... You're the first man who's ever been around me for a month without making love to me. Here are some examples of what this movie does in 1933 that it probably couldn't do in 1935. First off, our protagonists are self-assured, savvy women making their own way in the world, and it is rather strongly implied, I think, that they engage in the scandalous act of premarital sex. If Bonnie could see me in clothes, he wouldn't recognize you. That kind of agency for female characters largely evaporates in a postcode cinema, uh, save where you will find it in like the femme fatales of a noir, where it's an aspect of their villainy or maybe a character flaw that somebody has to overcome. They've got to uh, uh, live with proper standards of living. Why, well, I was just showing Miss Rich what you, what you can't do in Kalamazoo. They have to marry up and settle down. Women can't be working. There's a lot of movies made after the code about a working gal uh, with a, just a job who has to give up her job to become a wife. It's awful. I love the introduction of the characters. I think it's just a really wonderful device. The first like six or seven minutes of the movie as we do this big scene with all three girls sharing one bed in an apartment, which is weird because it's a big apartment, but yet they're all in one bed. It's a huge apartment. They have a huge part. They have a whole bunch of people over later. They're all in one bed and just the patter between them. I hate starving in bed. Name me a better place to starve. I mean, a lot of these jokes don't land on a modern audience because we don't have the references they're making, but like these are laugh out loud, slaying them in the seats lines. And you can tell because of the pauses in the pacing for the applause, for the laughter, to make sure that people hear the next line so they don't get stepped on. Because these movies were fast when they wanted to be. And here, this is played a little bit more spaced out. And it's a great device to introduce all the characters, the whole thing, everything, the setting, I love it. It's, I just love that opening beat. And then the stuff with them stealing the milk. Oh my God, it's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> what neighbors, oh, what neighbors. About 33 minutes into this movie, we get this exchange from Aline McMahon, who is strongly implying that if the show goes belly up, all these girls working here on the stage are instead gonna be working out on the street, and she's fucking furious about it. If you do, well, God knows what'll happen to those kids. They'll have to do things I wouldn't want on my conscience, and they'll be on yours. Just the acknowledgement that, like, <laughs> like, prostitution exists. These girls will become prostitutes. You will be responsible for that. Oh my God, no, you can't say that in a postcode movie. There was a very specific presentation to be made about American life and about womanhood that you could adhere to in a postcode movie, that you could not in a pre-code movie. So I would say that that scene, very pre-code. Um, and it's so quick, you'll, you'll miss it if you blink. I mean, the dialogue, some of the dialogue in this is so fast, you will miss it. And then that's one of those scenes too, that'll whoosh, go right by you without your acknowledging it if you're just kind of you know, if you're not paying very close attention. Through a good portion of this movie, the ladies think that their benefactor who's making the show possible, Dick Powell, is a bank robber on the run, and they like this about him. That's exciting. That's fun. That makes him a hero. He's risking going to prison for us. Oh, I like that kid. If he goes to prison for this, I'll visit him there. I swear I will. That is an explicit no-no in postcode movies. Um, the good guys, your protagonists, are not allowed to like bank robbers. <laughs> You're just not. You're not allowed to do that, okay? You're not allowed to like that. 
some confusion. I want to point this out right now. The gangster movie is a really, it's a pre-code genre. The code kind of kills the gangster movie. And there is a, I think a slight misconception out there that gangster movies and noir are the same thing. They're really not. Noir is a post-war um, phenomenon. Gangster movies are a pre-war phenomenon. Gangster movies before World War II. Uh, noir comes and replaces the gangster post-World War II. And gangster movies, the bad guys are kind of the heroes. They might get their comeuppance at the end, but it's a, it's a very different kind of thing. Whereas a noir, the detective is the hero. Always a detective. They might deal in the sordid, uh, disgusting, and seedy underbelly of the world of crime. Um, and they might even be a little bit twisted themselves, but ultimately it's about getting the bad guys, right? Whereas the gangster movies are usually about getting one over. I think another pre-code moment in this movie is when Barney, who's played by Ned Sparks, is selling the girls in the chorus on his idea of a show about the depression as a comedy. He says, I'll make them laugh at you starving to death. It'll be the funniest thing you've ever done. Terrible Ned Sparks, I apologize. I'm talking about ethics. And then goes on to talking about the number he wants to close on, which is My Forgotten Man. My Forgotten Man is about the bonus army. Remember My Forgotten Man? You put a rifle in his hand. Busby Berkeley was heavily insp uh, inspired by the plight of the bonus army uh, and a ve World War I veteran himself. Supposedly, by the way, Busby Berkeley got the idea for his geometric patterns of, design, of performance while um, recovering, I think at Walter Reed in, in the hospital, um, wounded and watching uh, men drill in the yard below. The Bonus Army is a real thing that happened. It was a band of um, homeless, starving, and out of work World War I veterans who marched on Washington demanding payment of a war bonus that they had been promised only to be gassed and charged on by cavalry commanded by General Douglas MacArthur. Da, that kind of social commentary. You know, particularly the way it points a finger, though maybe slightly indirectly, at the U.S. government for utterly failing to care for its citizens and veterans. That is the kind of thing that would get you blacklisted only a few years later. Or have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? It's unfortunate and tragic that I have to teach this committee the That's basic principles of Americanism. And what a number it is, too. The set piece is wild. It is a German expressionist influenced thing, a lot of deco elements to it. it has these two huge, uh, I think they must be 100 feet, 200 feet long treadmills that they used to have moving camera and groups of people marching against camera and to create movement in the scene and depth is really awesome cinema. Um, and it also features prominently on screen Etta Martin. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. I may not be. It's Etta Martin. Uh, Etta was an African-American singer who, prior to this scene and after, frequently provided the dubbed singing voice for others who were appearing on screen. What's wrong with the way I talk? Busby put her on screen, front and center, though she still didn't get a credit. I honestly can't find much on Busby's politics at this particular moment, but I'm pretty sure I'd read before that he was on the left side of the spectrum and that his signature parade of faces, which you will find in all of his musical numbers, which is a series of close-ups of all the girls in the chorus, was a trick he came up with to get uh, bit player rates or whatever upgraded rates for as many of his performers as possible. And also to democratize the camera, to put everybody front and center and to, and to focus on the, the group. Um, a communitarian kind of approach there. Uh, and also that the size and scope of his musical numbers from what I'd read uh, was at least in part about employing a lot of people during the depression. And a major goal of his productions was in general, a kind of depression era make works project for Hollywood. You will also find a lot of pre-code elements in the musical numbers of Busby Berkeley across movies. They're quite titillating, might I say. We're having a nice time here, Ginger. There is another Ginger Rogers cocktail. Think of my reputation. And it seems appropriate to pair that with this movie as well, of course, why not? I hope I get this guy's name right, but this other Ginger Rogers cocktail was invented in 1995 by Marco Vado Dionysius at a Portland bar called Zafiro. And I haven't looked up to see if it was still in business or not. I hope it is. So let's compare the 1933 drink to the 1995 drink and see which one is better. They're completely different concepts in drinks, by the way. This one's a highball. So we're gonna need a highball glass and we will need some fresh mint leaves. And although these are a little bit wilted, they're pretty fresh. 
Um, I did just buy them. So we're gonna need 10 or 12 of these. One, two, and we'll call that 12. Yeah, let's put a couple extra in for good measure. I like mint. And you got a muddler. Just give that a little press. A little muddling, don't go crazy. Now, I need three quarters of an ounce of ginger syrup. I need three quarters of an ounce of lemon juice. I uh, probably have that in this lemon, certainly the other half. I need two ounces of London Dry Gin. I know Aviation's not really a London Dry, but I think it's pretty it's close enough, I think. Um, and then I need a piece of ice. I'm going to use a nice Collins spear. And I'm going to give that a good stir. And now it needs about two ounces of ginger ale. I'll measure that because I'm not really sure. I think two ounces is less than I'm thinking on this glass. Maybe not. Normally I wouldn't do this, but. Oh no, that's perfect. Exactly where I would have poured to. And a straw. It's garnished with a sprig of mint. There we go. And this is Marcovado Dionysius's Ginger Rogers. That's delicious. It's like a, um, ooh, it's like a gin mojito. I love that. That's really great. A little bit of ginger heat, which is nice. I think that you could have switched the ginger ale for ginger beer and cut the ginger syrup. Probably that's what that's doing there. And then, um, but I, I really like it. I love the interplay of the mint, the lemon, the ginger, and the gin. They complement each other really well. It's super well balanced. It's a touch on the sweet side. It's a tall sipping drink. It should be it's just nice. It's very nice. There is a little bit of something in there that's a little unexpected. What is that? I think my ginger syrup is slightly fermenting. <laughs> Maybe that's what that is. I like it. It's very good. It's, um, it's fresh, delicious. It's a good spring drink. You might try it. I would be curious to try it with ginger beer, like a cock and bowl instead of the ginger syrup slash ginger ale. Um, then maybe it would need a touch of simple syrup to back sweeten it or something like that. I'm going home. I'm not gonna stand being salted like this. So I mentioned before that some movies were being distributed with alternative cuts in them to satisfy local censor board requirements. And that includes Gold Diggers of 1933. Some of the musical numbers in this, namely uh, Petting in the Park and We're in the Money, had content that simply couldn't pass censorship boards in some places. So special cuts were made, one for Kansas, one for New York, and so on. Ah, there, look at that. How can you expect to keep up a high moral tone with that going on? Wow. So far as I know, the version of this movie is currently widely available as the Hollywood cut, so all those dangerous West Coast morals are on full display. You're in Jersey City. And not in Hollywood. Petting in the Park, by the way, was supposed to close the movie out. But after seeing, remember my forgotten man, Daryl Zanuck and Jack Warner insisted that the movie be recut to finish with it as a blowout gut punch. This movie really feels right on the money for me in terms of attitude as we grind past the one year mark of this pandemic. The Great Depression started in 1929 and lasted through most of the 30s. And I guess there's some disagreement on the real duration, but nothing I've seen puts it at less than 43 months. That's three and a half years. Obviously not the same kind of thing. It's a different kind of threat, different solutions and mitigations and curatives are required, but I think in a lot of ways the vibe has got to be similar. You know, it's uh, drudgery and hoping to see the light at the end of the tunnel, the need for emotional endurance, etc. And I think we see the light at the end of the tunnel now, and I think they probably saw it too in 1933. Though in neither case was it here yet, and, uh, and all we can really do is spit in its eye and dig for our gold, whether in the loose pockets of Guy Kibbe or on a stage or wherever. Can you read where it says exit? Exit? You said it. You start walking and you keep walking. And if you ever come near him again, I'll break both your legs. I could easily resent that and scram. Well, that's it. You know where my socials are. I've got a second YouTube channel at HGD2, a Twitch at twitch.tv slash Greg from HGD. 
And I've been doing this show for about five years now, and there's a lot of different episodes I've done. Some of them are on old movies, though not as in-depth as this. Uh, and here's a few other episodes you might be uh, you might be into. Steer clear of chislers. Here's mud in your eye.